Hello, my name is Wade Nimmer, and this is Rotary Serving Our Community. Recently, I cut up to Dean Axelrod, who is the president of the Rotary Club of Santa Barbara, also um, works with Direct Relief. And I asked him, uh, what's going on with Direct Relief? I knew they were an actual global organization that serves uh, humanity in a number of ways. And uh, we set up and established a time where I can come by and take a tour of the place. And the first thing I noticed as I walked in the door was this big sign where uh, I was greeted by the uh, person actually at the desk and knew that it was a little bit more than going to be just a general tour. Uh, Dean then just came down to me, visited, and we talked about what was going on with Direct Relief. And the fascinating part about it was it was how enormous this thing actually is. The site itself is huge. And I took uh, my cameraman, Scott, with me, and we wanted to share with you actually the enormity of what this place actually does and is. With that, let's take a look at the video. So here we are at Direct Relief, actually at the headquarters itself and the warehouse. With me today, I have Dean Axelrod, who happens to be um, also a Rotarian and current president, right, of the Santa Barbara Club. That's correct. Very good. Well, Dean, thanks for uh, hosting us for this uh, event here. Thank it's going to be good for the tour. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, um, wait, I have kind of a mixed background, uh, sketchy past. <laughs> um, I've been at Direct Relief for about three years now. I'm the Associate Director for Partnerships and Philanthropy. Okay. Um, prior to coming here, I've been a financial advisor, uh, a lawyer, I've worked in nonprofit, uh, I've worked in um, uh, a variety of industries. And um, arriving here at Direct Relief was kind of the culmination of uh, a lot of different kind of experience where um, you know, my job is to connect with people, right. to build relationships, um, help make sure that the organization has the funds it needs to do the work. Um, but most importantly, it's building those relationships and connecting with communities uh, nearby and, and abroad. And my involvement with Rotary has really been an important part of that. Good. And how did you get involved with Rotary? You know, when I came to Santa Barbara, um, I, I didn't know anybody. And I wanted to connect with uh, business people, primarily who had uh, similar values to mine. Um, I wanted to build a community um, around myself of people who um, had respect for um, just you know operating at a at a higher standard, treating people right, uh, whether it's their customers, their employees, their vendors. And uh, I wanted to have a place where I knew I could go at least once a week <laughs> where I could you know, kind of just connect with like-minded people who shared those values. And I learned about Rotary and it sounded like it was a perfect fit. It was the four-way test that sold me. As soon as I learned about the four-way test, I said, these are gonna be people that um, I know I can, uh, I can be at home with. Great, and truly hooked now, you're serving as president. So uh, that's, right. that's taking another commitment above and beyond. Absolutely. And I see the two organizations just kind of matching out. Do you see it the same way where it's all about service. Absolutely, it really is. Um, you know, I was really struck initially when I came to work at Direct Relief. I'd already been involved in Rotary for a little while, and I was really struck by not just the commonality of values, integrity, um, you know, treating the the donations that we receive not like that's our money, but remembering that it's someone else's money, right, right. and being very thoughtful about how that money is used to support other uh, organizations, but also the areas of focus. Uh, when I looked at um, Rotary's approach to making the world a better place, um, and I saw alignments with Direct Relief's sort of programming pillars. Right. Uh, one of them that really got my attention was the maternal and child health program, right. disease treatment and prevention, um, and, and watching the way Rotary clubs around the world respond in emergencies right. that aligned so well with Direct Relief. And as I learned more about the history of the organization, I learned that we have a long history of working with Rotary Clubs to get the work done, uh, especially in developing countries and in parts of the world where it can be very difficult to connect with uh, the right kinds of local organizations to deliver medicines and medical supplies and get them where they're needed most. Rotary Clubs know where the need is, they understand their communities, and they've been fantastic partners over the years. Great. Well, uh, let's go ahead and get started with this tour. So okay. right now we are in Hatch Hall, I believe. That's right. So tell us a little bit about this place. It's pretty impressive. It's yeah. huge. Well, thank you. Uh, Hatch Hall is uh, named for um, one of Direct Relief's uh, longtime supporters, a uh, strong member of the community. 
um, and it reflects direct relief's uh, intentions. When we moved into this, this was a facility that we built, custom built. Uh, we moved in uh, about a year and a half ago, and uh, we needed it because Frankly, we were running out of space in our old facility. Uh, we needed to upgrade infrastructure. There were regulatory requirements that the facility needed to meet. And uh, as we embarked on the project, we wanted to also honor the community. And of course, we did it through um, you know, um, honoring donors, through naming parts of the building right. uh -huh. for their generosity, but also in the creation of the building itself. So Hatch Hall, is a multi-purpose uh, space within our, our building that we use for uh, staff meetings, but we also make it available to, the, to other organizations in the community nice. oh, nice. um, for events, for educational programming, uh, for our own series of guest speakers. We work with some remarkable people all over the world, and when they come to visit, we like to um, make that available to the community to come and learn from them and hear what they're doing. Great. So like everything else we do at Direct Relief, we try to make the money uh, go far. And right. so everything right. is, is adaptable and flexible. Okay. So some of the features of this room, which are terrific, are we have a um, state-of-the-art uh, AV system, the mm -hmm. monitor, uh, we have AV, we have um, uh, teleconferencing capabilities in the room. Uh, we have a sky wall that drops down that okay. divides the room in half. Right, right. We have volunteers who work in the, the back half of the room in our volunteer center uh, who come in and help us out every week. Uh, so it's a fantastic space and uh, I would encourage people to come by and have a look if they're interested in, in seeing it. Sounds good. Well, I got Scott here helping me out. Scott, well, let's do a little tour with the camera around this room. It's pretty impressive. And I'm guessing this actually seats quite a few people, a couple hundred people maybe? Yeah. Wow. Um, wow. And, we can, and we can change the uh, seating arrangement from tables like we have now, sort of mm -hmm. classroom or auditorium style. We can bring in um, round tables for um, a more banquet kind of um, set up. Right, we right. can take the tables out and just have people standing and mingling. <laughs> uh, we have a patio outside. It's right. a wonderful space. It for is. me to bring a, a guest and sit quietly and talk about the organization and their interest in, in providing support um, or as part of a, a reception. Right, right. And with the doors, it connects quite well to inside and outside. So that's, that's a good Santa, overflow. That's Santa Perfect. Barbara. That is Everything. Santa Barbara. That is Santa Barbara. Use the outdoor living space. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> well, that's great. Outstanding. And I see it's got good acoustics in here. Everything's great done acoustics, well. Great lighting. Yeah, um, exceptional. People seem to really appreciate is the the aesthetic approach to the design of the building. Right, right. Um, you know, we we wanted to make sure that every dollar spent on the construction of a building was uh, going to bring value, mm -hmm. and uh, we wanted it to to look and feel professional and state of the art, but without going over the top. And the designers put in really nice touches like that acoustic drop down on the ceiling, mm -hmm. which looks great. It does. <laughs> very effective for managing the sound in the room. Right. And it covers it, up all the mechanicals, does <laughs> all of the yeah. above. It's and nice. It, and it creates a space, if you look around, it creates an environment where, you know, an auditor from the Attorney General's office, a representative of one of our pharmaceutical company donors, um, a doctor who, you know, works in a rural facility in Malawi, um, anyone can come to this facility and feel at home, right. feel like it's a professional space that they can relate to. And, uh, and that was a really important um, design um, consideration. Right, right. And I do like it, all glass wall there, get the screens down, but yeah, that's got to be a pretty impressive uh, feel when those are all up. Yeah, yeah. So I'd like to uh, take you to the to the far end of the room, and we can go into the volunteer center okay. in the warehouse. Okay. Okay. Let's let's go on in. Double doors. So this is the back of Hatch Hall. Okay. And we're going to be entering the volunteer space within the warehouse. So this is um, where, when we have community packing events, okay, uh, chances for volunteers to come in and help us out. This is where we bring them. Okay. Perfect. This is uh, quite impressive. Thanks, Wade. This is the Schlosser Volunteer Packing Center. Well, you know, an interesting thing about Direct Relief's history, Direct Relief was founded in 1948 by an Estonian businessman immigrant. He fled Europe during the Second World War to escape the Nazis. 
and made his home in Montecito and after the war wanted to do something to help people who had been displaced by the war. And he set up this organization, privately funded with his own money, oh, wow. um, and he established a couple of core principles that Direct Relief has lived by for 71 years now. And one of them it was to, to connect with local partners in the places where the organization wanted to help, which we still do, mm -hmm. um, rather than assuming we know best what a community needs, we look to the people who have a stake in those communities, who have a history there and a stake in the future to find out what's really needed and how best to deliver aid. And the other thing that uh, William Zimden thought was so important when he founded the organization was to be careful with the money. And initially, all of the work was done by volunteers. Hmm. And wow. today, there's not a lot that volunteers can help with because as you can see, if you look around the warehouse, it's a state-of-the-art, professionally operated pharmaceutical and medical supply warehouse. Uh, and unfortunately, volunteers aren't <laughs> able to, to do the warehouse work. Um, but for over-the-counter products, so non-prescription drugs, we can use volunteers to come in from the community and we set them up in, in this room within the warehouse so they can be a part of that warehouse right. activity but still comply with all the regulations right. that are intended to protect uh, the integrity and the security of the pharmaceutical supply chain that we're a part of. Got it. So William Zimden's vision um, leads to two aspects of what you're seeing in the warehouse. One is we still like to use volunteers when we can, right, right. but um, we use um, paid staff um, for virtually all of our work. Uh -huh. But most importantly, all the inventory you see here, probably close to, in excess of 95% of the inventory you see in the warehouse mm -hmm. has been donated in kind by the manufacturer. Got it, okay. Uh, really important principle, we're still entirely privately funded, mm -hmm. so we don't get any government grants. Wow. So making every dollar we receive go farther really matters. Yeah. So by using best business practices, by leveraging those in-kind donations, every dollar that we receive from private donors can deliver many times that value right, right. in specifically requested medical aid. Great, so tell us real quickly uh, for the audience, the um, reasoning for the barrier, the screen barrier you have, because you told me last time it had to do with regulations. Sure, well that's exactly right. So uh, the uh, regulations that we have to work under Mm -hmm. um, are very strict with regard to access to the warehouse. Okay. So uh, it's very strictly and tightly controlled. So in order for volunteers to be able to be in the warehouse helping us pack products that are not um, uh, prescription medicines, right. we had to create a secure space within it. So it's a warehouse space within the warehouse. Within the warehouse space. So the, uh, the fencing that you see is simply a security access. Correct. Uh, so a forklift can come in bring in some inventory, we'll set up tables, and we'll have volunteers pack right. uh, hygiene kits, dental kits, emergency responder backpacks, um, and then the warehouse team can come in, pick them up, take them back in, put them into inventory, Got it. and we're still able to comply with the security requirements that we have, Got it. very tight security around the warehouse itself. Excellent, excellent. It's a great idea, by the way. And it, this is a very large area. Uh, it's, it's terrific. Itself. Yeah, it is great. Looking forward to a team of Rotarians to come in here and help we're, us back. We're waiting. Okay. We're definitely waiting for that opportunity. Um, Size-wise, what is the square footage of this? Because it's huge. It is huge. So the, the warehouse, the, the total facility, the warehouse and the administrative offices are 155,000 square wow. feet. Wow. Now, to put that in perspective, we were operating out of five separate warehouses scattered around the city of Goleta. We had one primary warehouse, which was about 35,000 square feet. Okay. Um, so this facility not only brought all of that inventory under one roof, it expanded the capacity. It's twice as tall mm -hmm. as our previous facility. And most importantly, we um, we're the first nonprofit organization, first charitable organization to be licensed to distribute prescription medicines in all 50 states. Wow. And the okay. National Association of Boards of Pharmacy uh, certifies, accredits the warehouse, but they only accredit, they accredit the physical facility. So before we moved in here, only one of those five warehouses was okay. accredited to store prescription medicines. Okay. In our current facility, the entire space 
could be filled with prescription medicines if that was necessary. Got it. So it adds tremendously to the efficiency of, of the operation. Um, and you'll see as we continue our tour, you'll see how the physical space makes it possible to do more. Um, uh, but it also just adds to the efficiency of bringing everything under one roof. This is just a little uh, sort of historical gallery that uh, gives you a history and pictures of kind of direct relief's evolution over the years. One of the things that I think is really, I don't know, it's kind of meaningful. And I think um, people who've been involved in Rotary for a long time have experienced this too. You know, founded in 1948, a lot has changed. Mm -hmm. And if you think back to the early days of Rotary, a tremendous amount has changed. Different ways of communicating, sure. the way we approach projects. Uh, but there's still so many things, and the things that are probably most important, I don't think they've changed at all. Hmm. And I think these pictures, they really, they really reflect that. The, the, the need in the world right. that we're responding to hasn't really changed. Hmm. The need of people who um, are living in poverty, or right. they are experiencing the effects of civil conflict or natural disasters, those basic human needs haven't changed. And the human compassion and empathy that results in this outpouring of support that you see among Rotarians and Rotary Clubs all over the world and that direct relief experiences uh, in the public response to our organization's programs. Um, and I think the, these photographs really reflect how different things can look, <laughs> uh, but really uh, at their essence, um, so much stays the same. True, true. It does show a good piece of your history. It's a nice documentation of all the things you do. So I'm going to walk us through the, uh, the upper part of the warehouse here. We have a, a catwalk okay. that lets us get a bird's eye view of the warehouse. And again, we're in compliance, so we're not, we're not in the warehouse where we shouldn't be. <laughs> okay. Uh, but we'll be able to get a good view of it. So this is a uh, wood section of the warehouse then? We just came through the doors. Um, you got a lot more inventory in here. <laughs> we got a lot of inventory. This is the main body of the warehouse. Okay. And uh, why don't we take a walk down, uh, down to the end and you'll, you'll okay. get a sense of the full scope of, of the facility. Direct Relief um, has worked very hard over the years to adopt the best practices and technology and the tools of the business world mm -hmm. where there's a wonderful profit motive to drive innovation and efficiency that's often missing in the charitable world. Got it. So, looking to the world of business for those innovations that we can adopt has enabled us to, to grow and become more efficient over time. So one of the things that we may see in the warehouse, for example, is the automated uh, inventory management system. Got it. You won't be able to see it directly mm -hmm. because it's in a computer mm -hmm. hidden away, but <laughs> what you will see is the way it's used. Got You'll it. see the warehouse yeah. team uh, driving through the, the warehouse on um, forklifts and other vehicles right. to either put material into inventory or to be pulling it out to fulfill orders. And you'll see them wearing headsets. Okay. And the headset is a voice-to-pick system telling them, kind of like when you uh, use your car navigation system. Right. You tell it where you want to go. And uh, if you use an iPhone, Siri jumps in and says, okay, Wade, <laughs> uh, start your route, go to the end of the road, turn left. Right, right. Well, we have Jennifer who <laughs> tells the warehouse team, uh, they tell it what order they're putting together. Okay. And um, Jennifer will tell them which part of the warehouse, which wow. quadrant, which pallet space, which section. they're all labeled. Wow, I see that. Um, and what to pull. That's and amazing. they repeat back into the microphone what they've pulled so that they can do a quality check in real time. Got it. The whole system runs on SAP uh, enterprise management software. Okay. Uh, also donated in kind nice. by SAP nice. uh, a number of years ago. And that has enabled us to really scale up. The amount of data that, that Direct Relief manages just for the inventory mm -hmm. is astronomical. But we've also <laughs> been that. able to use SAP to manage a whole range of data that lets us make 
better decisions faster True. and deliver aid more precisely than ever. Literally, yeah, I could see that, especially in times of disaster, you literally have an instant number of your inventory in which you could move. We know exactly what we have, yeah. we know where it is, yeah. we can bring inventory in faster, and decision making about how to deploy and how to mobilize right, that inventory right. is really important. So you and I were talking earlier about direct relief's response to the wildfires in Australia. Yeah, Australia, yes. So one of the things that our data analytics team did very quickly was pull together uh, mapping data in real time so that we can see, and, and we make it available to the public and the authorities in Australia and mm -hmm. other organizations like Rotary right. that is working with us jointly in this response to be able to identify population movement so we know where the people are who need assistance Got it. and uh, to get a sense of the scope and the um, evolution of the fires. So not only do we use the system to manage the inventory, but we also use it to make good decisions and to help others work with us to make better decisions, more precise decisions in the delivery of aid. Wow, so you're um, on, for example, Australia. What is your anticipated delivery date for that response? Well, the first shipment of N95 uh, particulate respirator masks was put on a donated Qantas Airlines flight oh, wow. yesterday afternoon, around five o'clock. Wow. It should be arriving, uh, might even be by now, Wednesday Australia time. Right, I think right. they're 14 hours ahead, <laughs> yeah. so we can do the math. Um, that first shipment, uh, Direct Relief made an initial commitment of its entire inventory of respirator masks, which is about 500,000 masks. Mm, wow. The first shipment was uh, just under 98,000 masks. Okay. The Rotary Club of Melbourne has a warehouse facility, and those masks are going to be delivered to that warehouse for further distribution. And we're working with the Rotary Club uh, to identify other clubs that can hopefully be a part of a broader distribution gotcha. with the follow on shipments that we're preparing now. Okay. Wow, that's impressive. <laughs> that is good, and it sounds again like Rody's quite the partner, helping you out quite a bit with these. Tremendous partner. It's another example of trusting the local civic organizations True. to know what's needed, where it's needed, and how best to get the aid right. to the people who need and it. And having their on site. It's, it's Absolutely. instant. <laughs> Absolutely. Great. And at the same time, that doesn't detract from other organizations True. and government agencies yeah. that yeah. are also doing the work. Uh, but every organization has its its area of focus, and uh, nobody can do it all. Right. So these right. partnerships, which is so much making connections, is so much what Rotary is about. Right. And it's the way Direct Relief has always done its work in order to do it more effectively and more efficiently. Exactly. Oh, that's great. Why don't we continue down to the observation platform? Sounds good. And I'll show you the um, the next the fulfillment area. So wow. this is where everything sort of comes to a head. Okay. So on the close side of the warehouse, closest to us, is where inbound inventory would come in. Okay. So a truck will pull up to those bays. Now you'll notice, if you look around the warehouse, there are no windows, with the exception of those little slits in the bay doors. Right, okay. Uh, that's for security. That's part of the regulatory environment we're in. Okay. There are no windows, you don't see any skylights, uh, a little more kind of uh, background about the building. So direct relief, delivers aid uh, throughout the year on an ongoing basis to support locally run health facilities that are serving people oh. who are either living in poverty or affected by disasters or other emergencies. And that's probably 85 or more percent of what we do. Mm -hmm. Our emergency preparedness and response program is where we get probably 80 to 90 percent of the attention <laughs> <laughs> that the organization gets. Um, but it's a relatively small percentage of our, of our actual work throughout the year. But because we're a critical uh, emergency response organization and we're part of the county and the state of California's emergency response infrastructure, right. it's really important that this place can continue to run yeah. <laughs> when there's a natural disaster here in Santa Barbara, True. in California. True. So this was built to 125% of the required earthquake uh, seismic standard. It was built entirely out of concrete, uh, concrete walls right. in order to uh, be fire resistant. Mm -hmm. It is uh, temperature controlled and humidity controlled 24-7. We have a backup power system. We have almost uh, a thousand solar panels on the roof and a uh, Tesla okay. smart power grid installed <laughs> so that we can operate in island mode 
if power to this area gets cut off, either because of a wildfire, an earthquake, or right. preemptively uh, to avoid a fire under high wind conditions, as, as we've seen recently. Which we're doing now, exactly. So not only are we, are, is Direct Relief able to continue to operate under the most extreme circumstances, but we also have backup excess power that we can use, and we made that available during our last um, fire emergency here, where um, the public and first responders could come to Direct Relief um, and use our backup power to recharge devices. Oh, and right. we were able to deliver mobile power to health facilities in order to keep them running. Got it. Something that's really critical in the modern healthcare system, even those facilities that are serving the most vulnerable are still using state-of-the-art medical record systems. <laughs> they are still using equipment that requires electricity to run. Right. They need refrigeration right. to store insulin and vaccines and specialty medications. Mm -hmm. All that requires electricity. Right. So Direct Relief is working to provide solar power and backup power to facilities and emergencies. Wow, that's great. Um, looking around too, uh, I see you have a few employees working around. How many people do you actually have um, manning the warehouse area? We have about 25 people 25. in the warehouse. Okay. I think we came at lunchtime, isn't it? Uh, close time, close time, to lunch. Time that we took a break and, <laughs> yeah. uh, and got a sandwich. There you go. Right? Uh, so there are about 25 people that work okay. in the warehouse. It can get pretty noisy around here. Yeah, I guess. Um, and so as I was explaining, the inbound inventory will come in on this side, the early bays, one, two, three, four. The uh, outbound inventory will typically will go out on the far side. Mm -hmm. When the team is going through the warehouse and pulling products off the shelves, they, they'll bring them into the center of the warehouse here. They'll organize them into pallets and shipments. Um, there are certain um, kinds of uh, responses that we'll do with a modularized solution, like hurricane uh, preparedness uh, supplies or um, an emergency health kit. These are standardized, packaged, uh, multi-bin um, uh, products that are designed based on experience and working with the first responders and the medical providers uh, so that they have what we know they're gonna typically need in any of these kinds of situations. So they know what they can expect when they place an order right. for supplies, they know exactly what they're getting. Exactly, yeah. So that'll all be put together in the center area of the warehouse. Mm -hmm. It'll be then, uh, the pallets will be wrapped for uh, larger shipments, mm -hmm. and then it'll be put on the shelves while we're waiting for paperwork, customs paperwork to be processed, or we're nice. waiting for the, uh, the shipping to be arranged. And on the far side of the warehouse, you'll see smaller shipments being prepared. Those smaller boxes are typically going to be our U.S. program. Okay. So the United States, most years, is the largest dollar value <coughs> recipient of direct relief's aid of anywhere in the world. Uh, we're delivering aid to probably around 100 countries right uh -huh. now. And the U.S. typically receives the largest dollar value amount of any other country. <coughs> Now we ship on, a, on an ongoing weekly replenishment basis to U.S. clinics and through um, uh, FedEx, which uh, donates uh, about four million plus dollars a year of uh, air freight mm -hmm. credit to us. And so that'll all go out air freight on a weekly basis. And these larger shipments are either gonna be for a massive uh, emergency response or a more typical international response, ongoing support where larger volumes will go out on a less frequent basis. You got it. Well, that's great. <laughs> Outstanding. Sounds like you definitely have it together on this. We have a board, too, on this side. I remember seeing last time. It was pretty sure. impressive. This is um, a display that provides us with real-time updates on our warehouse operation. Okay. So we use, I mentioned that we use SAP. SAP is basically, uh, you can think of it as a massive uh, database, uh, a lot more than you can do with an Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> and uh, you have to take that data and turn it into something that humans can look at and work right. with and make decisions about. Right. Uh, so we use a product called Click, which is a visualization product that takes all that data and uh, we get to decide how we want to look at it, how we want to be able to drill down. So what we're seeing here is outbound shipments in these, these screens, these displays will, will circulate data, we'll see outbound, we'll see inbound, we'll see warehouse status and activity. So we have a real-time snapshot of where we are with a variety of orders and you can see the various countries yeah. that uh, yeah. we're working on uh, right now, mm -hmm. as well as the status uh, of those orders as they're being fulfilled.
You got it. And at the far side is your um, actual warehouse changes? Yeah, you can see on that warehouse, the, uh, that warehouse display, the, the evolving capacity of different parts of the warehouse mm -hmm. so that the warehouse management team uh, has an easy way at a glance to get a, an understanding of where we are, what our capacity is. Uh, you know, if you've worked with data, and I know you have, uh, you know, it's people, human beings do really well visually, and as a rule, we don't do as well when we're just looking at numbers. Okay. And so if you look at a spreadsheet full of numbers, um, it's not always as meaningful as being able to see what is effectively a map. Mm -hmm. uh, and speaking of maps, our warehouse activity display just turned over mm -hmm. to a map display of the aid that we've provided in the current fiscal year. Uh, the, our fiscal year wow. runs like Rotary mm -hmm. uh, from July through the end of June. So we're about halfway through our fiscal year and you can see a color-coded map that's showing where aid is going. We'll yeah. often take maps like this and we'll overlay it with other data mm -hmm. that shows us where the need is and how the need may be evolving in different, uh, in different programs. So we can see if we need to redirect or retarget some of that aid. Yeah, that is impressive. <laughs> Now, everything that we do, every, all the aid we deliver weight is specifically requested. Okay. Direct Relief is uh, kind of a bottom-up organization in terms of figuring out where the need is and what's needed. We don't ship anything that hasn't been specifically requested. Our, our health facility partners um, will place uh, requests for supplies through uh, an online portal. Okay and our pharmacy team will evaluate those orders, make sure that we're distributing what we have as equitably as possible, mm -hmm. um, and, then, uh, and then the product goes out. And we're able to monitor especially high value shipments in real time. Mm -hmm. uh, our cold chain capability is unmatched. One of the things that I wanted to point out, if you, we look down back toward the, uh, the shipping bays again, you'll see a room in the corner there. It says BD Global Health. Right. Pharmaceutical cold room. Got it, cold room. That yeah. is a, that's a room that's the size of a, a typical single family home <laughs> that uh, is just for storing uh, cold chain medicines, uh, okay. vaccines, cancer drugs, uh, insulin, gotcha. uh, hemophilia mm -hmm. uh, treatments. Uh, all these products that have to be kept cold within a very precise range. That'd and be polio have, vaccines too. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, and um, the shipping has to be carefully monitored mm. to make sure that they stay within a very tight temperature range Got it. throughout uh, the shipping process. Right. So all of that is monitored in real time with state-of-the-art shipping and monitoring technology to make sure that uh, when the medicines get where they're going, that they're still effective and right. still right. at the highest level of quality. Wow. <laughs> Fundamental principle is that uh, you know, our, the people who benefit from the work that Direct Relief does right. um, shouldn't have to do with anything that's lower quality than what you and I can get yeah. uh, when we go down to our corner wow. drugstore. Wow. And uh, that's, that's really important. That's great integrity on your part. <laughs> Good yeah. for you. It's, you know, it's about treating people with respect, yeah. and it's about treating the countries where we're working with respect. Yeah, the communities, either in the U.S. or abroad, um, there's no reason why anybody sure. should get anything less when it's there, when it's available. Sure. The manufacturers have it and want to give it and want to <laughs> do the right thing and help make the world better and help make people's lives better. Right. right. And uh, so there's no reason not to do it. Definitely so. <laughs> Outstanding. That's great. Um, I guess we could uh, move on back. Actually, real quick before we sure. do, you want to go through one of these lines? We're looking at a chart right now, but um, just a little brief explanation yeah. of how that is read. Sure, you know, some of, it's, some of it is kind of warehouse technical, mm -hmm. um, but the gist of it is, we'll see an order number, it's called a delivery number, uh -huh. and uh, if you were sitting at your desk looking at this, you'd be able to click on that delivery number mm -hmm. and get more details about that order, okay, what's it. in that order uh, and where it's going. And so you'll see as we go across, you'll see the, the order number, the country where it's going, you'll see uh, the program, Mm -hmm. uh, and programs are defined really just as operational, um, to organize our operational efficiency uh, around the idea. Okay. Um, it'll have the departure date, estimated uh, delivery time, and locations relating to the logistics process, whether it's going by air or by sea, okay. whether it's a cold chain shipment. Got it. Um, 
and uh, again, well, you know, is it hazardous material? Okay. Um, and just you know, important key um, uh, key key data points that help the warehouse and operations team track and make sure that um, delivery is happening when it's supposed to happen, wow. where it's supposed to happen, and that we're meeting our quality standards. So this one syncs to real time overall? Yeah. All, all day long. Yeah. All day long updated. That is, that is impressive. Now much of our data is also available on our, on our website. So okay. the public, we don't have this level of, of detail on the public website, but uh, you can go on to okay. directrelief.org and you can uh, look at our aid map okay. and drill down by country uh, down to the level of, of a city and a clinic wow. to see what aid has been delivered over a, a, a time frame that you can select. It's an interactive map. And there are other uh, maps that show our hurricane preparedness and response program, story maps that talk about uh, maternal and child health, the kinds of support that we're providing and, and how direct relief is making an impact and why it's so important uh, that we be doing this work. So there's a lot of great information if any of your viewers are interested in, in digging a little deeper and learning more about why this work is, is so important and how it's being done and how all of this 1.2 billion dollars uh, wholesale <laughs> value of medicines wow. and supplies how that's being mobilized around the world okay that's all available uh, and transparent to the public perfect well that sounds good all i'm right. sure we're going to have people looking at that including me all right yeah, it sounds interesting very interesting good. well um we have any other sections here that you want to show us around no, you've to? seen you've seen the warehouse okay um why don't we uh, head back out okay sounds good all right Not to disturb everybody, it looks like you have quite a think tank going in right here. <laughs> so how many people do you have working this part of it? Well, we've got about 75 people working on the administrative side, running the programs, compliance, finance, human resources, communication, IT, all the, all the functions of any business, really. Okay. Um, and so what, we're on two floors. The administrative office is on the ground floor. We have the programs and the, the compliance and the pharmacy team. And upstairs, we've got communication and, okay. and IT and, yeah. and finance. And um, we try to run pretty lean. So if you think about, you know, 100 countries, right. $1.2 billion wholesale right. value yeah. and aid delivered, and a staff of about 100 people, okay. um, most of whom work right here. Mm -hmm. This is the direct relief facility. We do have a few people in, in uh, other spots, in, uh, in some other countries. you got Mexico, right, right. we've got somebody in South Africa, okay. we've got somebody in, in Europe. Okay. Um, uh, but this is pretty much it. Right. And it's all part of that idea of leveraging your resources and trying to get as much as we can done okay. um, with the right number of people. Now, how about languages? Since you're international, do you have uh, specific language needs and people that you employ for that? Well, we, we do have some language capability here. We've got a pretty diverse workforce. Okay. Uh, probably the area where um, the, the, the language skills help the most is with the Spanish language. Correct. The work that we do in Latin America, mm -hmm. um, uh, often the, the partners we're connecting with um, right, right. don't speak English. Right. And so having people on staff who are fluent in Spanish is a, is a huge help. Got it. For example, we're working on one right now with Guatemala. That's so right. We can get one coordinated there. Exactly. That, that's good. And that would be uh, covering quite a bit of what your needs are. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Oh, that's, great. that's great. So um, we've got a few more pictures here, but in the meantime, we'll probably let these people get back to work. All right. That sounds good. Thanks. I'd like to thank Dean for that video tour. I mean, amazing, as you can see, making differences around the world. At the same time we did the tour, there's large fires going on in Australia, and we were able to see firsthand how Rotary and Direct Relief would work together in partnerships. There were 500,000 masks that were to be delivered to Australia, and the way that Direct Relief was going to do it, the distribution of all these masks were actually going to be done by Rotarians on the ground in Australia. So the partnership actually worked out well. The first shipment just recently went out. 91,000 masks were sent to Melbourne, and they were going to be distributed by the Rotarians in that area. 
As you can see uh, also that uh, Rotary is reaching outward above and beyond just Rotarians doing the work, but also with these organizations with like-minded thinking. With that, take a look yeah, in your area of areas and groups that you could see that may be able to help you out also doing the same thing. With that, thank you very much and we will see you next time.